Morgoth didn't care about omens. After he became king, he left his omen brothers locked up in the sewers. He used them in the War of the Shattering. He sent them into battle with cleavers with merely a wrap of cloth for a handle, a weapon cursed to break. He rose to power, but did nothing for his kind. For Morgoth was not an omen saint. He was a saint for the Erdtree, its most loyal apostle. He loved the Erdtree, and though this love was unrequited, he devoted all his power, his cunning, and his unquestioning obedience to it. It led only to failure and death. But Morgoth believes he lived and died with honor. But his honor rests on the framework of his beliefs. Disgust may mislead. Empathy can mislead. We must quiet both to find what Morgoth really did in the lands between. Because Morgoth is an enigma. Morgoth was born a failure. His parents were strong and beautiful, a goddess and a warrior. Morgoth, along with his twin, inherited strength, but not beauty, and many, far too many other traits besides. The traits of many creatures, many minds, many souls. Whether Morgoth and Mog were born after their brother Godwin, or they were Marika's first children, we do not yet know. What is clear is the stark difference between the siblings. Godwin is almost a parody of a demigod, his appearance something found only in myth or art. Morgoth is born horned, tailed, coated in fur, his twin winged and fanged. Godwin is very likely given a finger maiden as a wet nurse, given freedom, status, and goes on to honor the golden lineage in his lifetime. Morgoth is kept secret, sent below the capital, and locked away for the shame and danger he represents. For Morgoth was not worshipped as a signifier of the divine, even at his birth. He was born one of the graceless omen. At his first moment, the greater will rejects him. Marika and Godfrey recognize this. Godfrey, the leader of the famous Crucible Knights, knights who, at the time of Morgoth's birth, are still honored, understands the difference. The knights have the blessing of potential. Morgoth has its curse. As Morgoth was born one of them, it is likely some others have come before, and they were all graceless. Marika and Godfrey name their son Morgoth, but it is a name that no one will know until much later for their son is to be kept a secret. How could a child of the golden lineage, the golden bough, be so malformed? If those blessed by gold could have such disordered offspring, then it is more than an omen. It is proof that at some point, the system will fail. So on his birth, they hide him away, and then see to it that Morgoth is locked up away from prying eyes, underground, unbeknownst to anyone, imprisoned for eternity. And we know it is in secret. How? Godfrey calls him Morgoth. Morgoth is the name used much later in his life, a name used publicly. If this name was widely known to be the name of Marika's omen offspring, he would never be accepted in Leyendal. But Morgoth is a name that was buried underground, and he is not only kept underground as other royal omen were, he is kept under strictest confinement, magically bound to the ground by golden magic. The fetish imbued with magic bears the symbol during the time of crucible worship, adapted to represent the omen curse that relates to it. The gold draws the blessed crucible that birthed this new era, but omens were never worshipped, even in these early days. It is no divine signifier, it is a curse, a cause of harm and misery. Morgoth's horns physically prevent him from even resting his head. 
They push through his flesh painfully, leaving welts and sores. His joints seem riddled with arthritis. His skin is pockmarked and infected. He can only see out of one eye. The other is crowded by horns. Horns would have blocked both eyes entirely, but to see clearly, some horns had to be cut, an operation that came at great risk to Morgoth's life. Other horns still crowd his right eye, but Morgoth prefers compromised vision rather than risking death to continue clearing them away. If you're enjoying the video, it really helps us out if you like and subscribe. We've got a lot of content planned, and we can't wait to share it with you. These are just the physical symptoms. Spirits twist and fight for release within him. Thoughts, emotions, and desires that are not his own battle for place. His blood boils with a maddening heat, and if sleep comes to him, it comes with nightmares. Nightmares haunted by elders. For an omen is not only physically the aspects of many, body, mind, and soul are all overfilled and attacked from within. It is no wonder omens are mad, aggressive, and in many ways, worthy of pity. But do not pity them and deny them their affliction. To live as an omen is a brutal existence. Because it is a pestilence on life itself, anyone who carries it is a great risk. At the core of the treatment of omens is not a sadistic desire to cause pain. At least, that's not how it started, and prejudice grew with time. After all, an omen does not choose to be born cursed. Please don't hate me, or curse me. Please. In Morgoth's case, a royal, his plea was listened to with more kindness than most. Royal omens could have been culled like animals, or cut like commoner omens. Instead, they are shunned, and it is Morgoth's own mother who likely decided on the shunning grounds as a solution. We do not know if Marika cared for Morgoth, or even visited him during his time below the capital, but she would see him again above ground, much later. Did she pity him during his confinement? Some care for omens enough to memorialize them, but did Marika love Morgoth at his birth? Whether born of a mother or of a bow, he is Marika's child. When Marika lost her son Godwin, it pushed her to the brink. But looking at history, Morgoth's suffering does not seem to disturb Marika's relentless plans. Godfrey is a little different. Godfrey understands what it means to have an uncontrollable nature. His appearance hides what he is, more of a beast than a lord. He must at least pity Morgoth and his affliction. However, it is unlikely Godfrey fought for Morgoth's release, and if he did, it was unsuccessful. To conduct himself as a lord is to follow the rules of the society, even if it concerns your own son. If he at least visited his son in the dungeons, these visits cannot last, for Godfrey is sent away from the lands between after which, he will only have one more meeting with his son, once they have both been given grace, but it will be too late to tell him that he conducted himself as a true lord. Morgoth grows down in the shunning grounds. He must at first feel pain, confusion, panic at each terrible symptom of his curse, the disorder of mind and body for a young Morgoth would have been a constant trauma. For anyone born to a life of such conditions, it may well turn them into a maniac. In time, Morgoth must become aware of his place in the world, and of the nature of his curse. So too does his curse grow in power. He gains the stature of his father, and a strength that in time may match any demigod. He can feel it within him, even if he cannot wield it. His blood burns. Pinned to the ground by golden magic, he must yearn to break this seal, and use the growing power of his cursed blood. His treatment may well deserve revenge, as he now understands what has been done to him, and he resents them for it. Today, the capital is quiet. 
well past its former glory, some can hear the groans of the omens down below. And it disturbs them to hear it, to know these abominations are beneath their feet. But how much worse to hear the sounds of the capital while it flourished from down in the shunning grounds. Morgoth, Mog, and the other royal omen have to listen to the victories and celebrations as the Erdtree's empire expands. They must listen with an aching longing to the joys of the citizens of Leyendale during the Age of Plenty. Morgoth receives none of the blessings of this age, and must listen as this entire age passes him by. Gold blesses the citizens of Leyendale, grace guides all but the forsaken. Morgoth hears his father returning from various battles, and the celebrations of his triumphs. He hears the attack by the ancient dragons, he may hear Godwin battle, his blessed brother once again finding glory. He hears his mother's second marriage to Radigan, her new husband and his new stepfather. He hears these things from the sewers, alone. What he does not hear is Marika sending his father away. There is no battle to hear, as Godfrey does not fight this order, but accepts it and Morgoth must only realise that his father has left the Lands Between some time afterwards. He may have heard it from Rollo, the renowned perfumer who must have visited Morgoth. As a royal omen capable of speech, Morgoth would have been of interest to Rollo, far beyond his duties. Morgoth would already have been the most important omen below the capital at the height of Rollo's career. It may be from Morgoth that Rollo learns of the omen's nightmares and incorporates it as the first omen killer. Morgoth will have dealings with these omen killers, but much later, there is still a long while left in the sewers. Morgoth is now without his father, shunned by his mother, and unknown to the rest of the world. Many other omen crowd the shunning grounds now. Did Morgoth have his twin for company all this time? or were they separated for their confinement? If so, Morgoth may not know he has a twin at all. As the age of Radigan goes on, Morgoth must reach a new state of mind. Instead of acting the way he is treated, or as a direct response to it, he will choose how to act. Most in the Lands Between behave in a very understandable way. If you treat me as a monster, so be it. I shall act as a monster. But Morgoth decides to act beyond his circumstances. Morgoth begins to understand the realities of the world above, and accept them. Omens under the current form of order are dangerous. If he wasn't an omen, but instead the ruler of the lands between, what would he have done in the ruler's place? Morgoth battles with resentment and hate and even infatuation with his own blood and power. But even in the shadows cast by the Age of Plenty, there is no doubt. He has only seen glimpses of its works, but the Erdtree is a miracle, and Morgoth now begins to devote himself to it. Not to his mother or his family, not to his twin or omen brothers, but to the Erdtree and to its order. Where Mog goes deeper into his wildness and glories in his omen nature, eventually going so far as to try to create a whole new order, Morgoth believes in how things are. The Erdtree order is already incomparable, even with its mistakes, one of which he is living with. He comes to these beliefs slowly, and they will never leave him. Now, he must persuade his mother to release him, for Marika does not trust lightly, not even her own family, not even her own son. But somehow, he persuades her. He persuades her that he is no longer tempted by his cursed blood and its power. He persuades her of his devotion. Did Marika now ask him to prove it, or were Morgoth's next actions his own idea? Whatever the case, in an act that shows his decision to control his omen side and his immense willpower, he recants his accursed blood, 
and seals it away. The word recant may also show the mental side of this action. It is also an act of the mind, and an act of faith. He denies the attraction of its power, or even its potential for a different order. Morgoth is then, for the first time in his life, granted freedom. He comes to the surface, and becomes a loyal servant of the Erdtree. And to this end, he serves Marika. At this point, he assumes the name Margit. The world has never seen him, never heard of Morgoth. Margit is an omen, an intelligent and horned omen whose strength is so terrible that Marika has chosen him to serve her personally. That he is of the Golden Lineage, or Marika and Godfrey's son, is a secret. It may be like any beast that is usually killed, but that shows exceptional strength, it is allowed a small freedom. Margit is his public face. It is very likely that Morgoth keeps the ragged furs from his captivity, filthy and stained, to remind him of his place. They may even be a comfort now. They are made of fur. Fur is of an animal, which is much of his nature. His head sits in a collar shaped almost like a crucible. Under the Erd Tree, no matter his power or social rank, he is an omen, and he will make sure he never forgets it. He is willing to live in rags, to disdain and resent himself, such is his love for the Erd Tree. A mother to a demi-human once made a prattling paid sculpture in the shape of her child's face. It says, you're beautiful. The description says, unconditional love, unrestrained assurance. It must have been a mother speaking. But some women in this world do not share these instincts. Is Morgoth humble or humbled? How much is the world responsible for his attitude? Or could it be the influence of just one person? Marika can be ruthlessly cruel, and she treats those less than human with brutal unkindness. Whether it's the giants, a lowly blacksmith, or even those you would expect her to be kind to, like her husband, her loyal other half. Would the shame of her son lead to abuse? For it is not just humility Morgoth seems to have, is it also self-loathing? His robes aren't only rags, they are filthy. They are caked in dirt and likely reeking, as though they haven't been washed since leaving the sewers. The creators of Elden Ring's world have a long history of characters abused in captivity, made to wear their filthy clothes of imprisonment even once they are released, to remind them of their place, to shame them, to keep the mind captive even once the body is free. Part of Morgoth's relationship to himself may also be a vestige of some horrific treatment below the capital, but we cannot know. We can only ask why he is so harsh on himself. Margit helps Marika and Radigan maintain their golden order. He has a connection with his mother at last, as her assassin. He is charged with culling those who become too strong. The time of great heroes is past, the order and the hierarchy is established. Leave a hero to strengthen too long, and a new Godfrey may arise, war-hungry and willing to challenge the rulers in place. Margit is given the charge of the Knight Cavalry, who ride funeral steeds and deliver death for great warriors, knights, and champions. With death sealed, it is a required task, and he takes on this essential responsibility. These honoured heroes, the moment they become a risk, would soon receive a visit from this Erdtree loyalist. There were once heroes who walked the battlefields, abundantly blessed by the Erdtree itself, who, upon earning their honour, simply died. Margit was extremely effective. His gruesome appearance and terrible strength earned him a nickname, Margit the Fell Omen. An omen of terrible ferocity, deadly, for he was fell to every hero he called upon, and no challengers rose up, no harm was brought to Marika or her children, until Morgoth failed his mother once again. For one night, 
a knight that should have been watched over successfully by Margit's cavalry. A group of female assassins, invisible to the eye with their magic veils. Slaughter, Marika's child. Godwin the Dragonslayer dies in soul, and his body is terribly damaged and infected. Marika sees her son, who should have lived a life eternal, destroyed. Margit's cavalry respond so quickly after the event, they catch the assassins in flight. They almost kill Electo, the ringleader, only for her daughter, Tish, to die defending her. His cavalry are relentless, and they chase down Electo and lock her in an Everjail. But Margit's responsibility was prevention, not punishment. The demigods have felt their first taste of death, and Margit blames himself. He creates the sentry's torch, imbued with magic that reveals assassins cloaked in veils, and gives it to the protectors of the Erd Tree. With this, he hopes that such a knight of black knives will never come again. How long after Marika loses her son does she shatter the Elden Ring? If death had never come to a demigod, would she have done it at all? To Morgoth, who loves the Erd Tree, he must view this decision as foolish, perhaps even treacherous. On the Elden Ring breaking, Morgoth receives a gift, a great rune, Hear me, demigods, my children beloved, make of thyselves that which ye desire. Be it a lord, be it a god, but should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. But is this true? If none of them fight each other, and they come together, then things can remain as they were. When the runes are brought back together, that is when it can be rebuilt. If you loved the Erd Tree, you shouldn't allow Marika to tempt you. Morgoth knows his place, he is not guided by the flame of ambition. Do his siblings learn from him, and try to resist their newfound strength for the greater good? In any case, the temptation of power gets the better of them, as its maddening taint takes hold. Morgoth is humble, even in response to Marika breaking the Elden Ring. And surprisingly, of all his siblings, it is his twin who differs most here. Mog escapes to form his own, new, order. Mog can be seen in his new, ornate robes when he steals Mikola, having escaped the squalid sewers and replacing it with the finery of his planned order. A new dynasty of blood an order he hopes will replace the dominant order of the Lands Between. But Morgoth wants only to mend and aid the Erd Tree, keeping his garments and accepting his station. His other siblings are closer to Mog. They crave power. The mad taint of their new power infects them, and they fight amongst themselves to gain the great runes. Morgoth views them as traitors. Traitors not to Marika, the mother who didn't care for him as a child, and simply put him to use as a blade in his later life, but as traitors to the Erd Tree and to the Order itself. And as Marika wishes this to happen, his mother is a traitor to the Erd Tree too. Morgoth decides he must protect the Erd Tree from being invaded and taken over by whatever alternative order is desired by the victor. Whether it be a bodiless witch, a rotten demigod, or someone deluded enough to try and start an entirely new order. To keep the Erd Tree safe, he relies on more than his strength. He begins to rely on illusion. Morgoth himself was born into hiding. His whole life has been a secret, buried in the shadows. He now takes this aspect of his history and uses it. Margit now becomes the illusionist, and the illusion. And if he has not received grace for his work with the Knight's Cavalry, he receives it here, when he becomes the Veiled Monarch of Leandal. The name Morgoth rises from the darkness, not as an omen, but as a king. 
He is given the talisman pouch by the Finger Maidens and the Two Fingers. He is accepted as ruler by the Greater Will. Now that Morgoth is the best option, the God of the Erd Tree has graced him and given him the right to rule. And to the world who has never heard the name of Morgoth, he is now the King of Leandal. This king meets with no one in person, yet no single person apart from Morgoth knows this fact. They each assume their station isn't high enough for such an honour, so he creates this fantasy around him. And while it is not a perfect illusion, some pierce it, Gideon the All-Knowing being one of them. But the knowledge of few amongst the noise of many does not spread, if it is shared at all, and most souls of the lands between are unaware that they are ruled over by an omen. But the Greater Will and the Erd Tree are just as ruthless as ever. Just as no blessings were wasted on Morgoth's birth, neither does the Greater Will gift any more here than is absolutely necessary. He may be Monarch, but he is not Elden Lord. He is still an Omen. An Omen cannot re-enter into the system. Such a folding could corrupt the Order entire, creating a pox upon life itself. He is no true king, and Bloodhound Knight Floor knows it. Floor continues his wait for a true king to serve. The Erdtree rejects Morgoth, remaining blocked by thorns. He would only enter to restore things as best he can, but even this is met with failure. Despite this, he does not stop loving the Erdtree, and continues his duty and his duty is protection as a steward, protection of the Erdtree against the traitors. He defends Leandel in an all-out war, Leandel's second defence, stacking high the corpses of his enemies. The wall is never breached. He fights back Radan, the lion of the battlefield and the conqueror of the stars, as Margit and the wall is still unbreached. Melania may be undefeated, but she never challenged Morgoth, and no demigod succeeds in entering the capital. The wall is unbreached to this day. And he doesn't just defend. He takes actions against heresy and those attempting to undermine the Erdtree's system. He sends his troops to attack the Volcano Manor, laying siege upon it until even those faithful to Rikard regret ever rebelling. All this time, he makes sure to cull any traitors, tarnished, or champions who have ambitions for Elden Lordship. He calls mighty heroes to join his ranks, accepting many who have been outcast in the past. Banished or not, he needs strength in this chaos of the Shattering. We know he called Engvall, a banished knight who rejected Margit to watch over a masterless castle and he called Banished Knight Oleg, who took up the call, undoing his banishment. He killed a hundred traitors under Margit and earned the honour of an Erdtree burial. He gives their actions just reward, and once again this is the conduct of a lord, as he gifts what he himself will never be permitted, an Erdtree burial. But his ruthless service to the Order, his unwavering fixation on what is best for the Erdtree, leads to other, more severe, decisions. For it is not only those who were banished that Morgoth accepts during the war, he uses his own kind. He had forgotten the royal omens below the capital. His freedom did not grant them theirs. But now, more unkind than this neglect, he uses omens as weapons of war. He cannot have pity for them, he cannot lose this war. Just as the Greater Will spares no expense on Morgoth for the sake of the Order, this harshness goes down the chain. Morgoth wastes nothing on the Omen. He sends them into battle as brute force warriors. He awards them cleavers, a tool of war made to take advantage of brute, untrained strength. These weapons blister the hands that wield them, as they aren't even equipped with a handle and in a final insult, showing the Lord's mistrust of his own kind, they are cursed to break. This ruler wouldn't want omens causing trouble once the fighting is over. Armed with a cleaver, they could become trouble for the capital's omen killers. In the lands between, perfumers, 
the healer Trisha, and perhaps even Fia are kinder to omens than Morgoth is. But we shouldn't speak too soon. After all, Trisha fails to help the omens, and Morgoth understands the omen curse better than anyone. Morgoth does whatever it takes, and he succeeds. No traitor gains power while the fell omen and his hands roam the lands between, and he manages all of this while ruling as a king, while carrying out the battlefield victories as Margit, still wearing his rags and ensuring the running of the capital as Morgoth, who has traded the Shadows of the Depths for the shadows cast by statecraft. He tirelessly defends to this day, until he defends his Erdtree against us. The first rune a Tarnished usually seeks is the rune of Godric the Grafted, or as Morgoth respectfully calls him, Godric the Golden. Morgoth materialises with golden magic to block our journey to his relative, to our first great rune. He has kept his identity separate, and we will not know we have met the ruler of Leyendel until much later. He wastes no courtesy on greeting us, mocking our ignorance and how easily we are led by others. The hunt for glory, the flame of ambition inside us, makes us rush headlong into a world we do not understand. He does not respect this attitude. Even in the fight, we can see a glimpse of who he really is, a lord of illusion, making mighty gold hammers out of the air that disappear an instant later. He himself disappears after the fight, his death yet another trick. His voice on the wind warns us of the hands of the fell omen. The hands of the fell omen shall brook thee no quarter. The knight's cavalry still roam, and will kill us if they find us. Later, as we come closer to his capital, he uses the body of an old, wandering noble. He possesses this body with golden magic from the time of his birth, the symbol of the Crucible. On defeat, he departs again, the corpse of the man left behind, used and discarded, just like the troops and omens in the Shattering. Finally, we meet him in flesh and blood at the entrance of the Erdtree, the spirit-like, golden thrones are glowing. Morgoth must know that for us to be here, many of those who ought to sit on these thrones are dead. He does not mention his twin, but the others? For him, they are all traitors. And he does not mourn them. He greets us as pillagers, and he is not wrong. We have taken every rune we possess by force. He prepares to fight us for the third time, revealing yet another illusion. His walking stick and staff is in fact his accursed blood that he recanted, resealed into a blade. Its shifting hues and natures showing all the natures within an omen, growing from within them, torturing them. He fights with the strength expected from someone who has never known defeat, until his strength begins to fail, and the grace of gold he was granted breaks. His blood is unsealed, mixing into its omen chaos, staining the thrones. His omen hues have no place here. Morgoth is ashamed of himself, but he is even more ashamed of his curse, this twisted error of life itself. He promises he will never forget our part in this. He has stained the thrones right beneath the Erd Tree, but it ends an empty threat. Finally, Morgoth falls. The greater will does not save him, for in the great scheme of things, there is no reason to. On death, his omen features seem to leave him, and his human essence is left to die. He can barely speak but tells us we shall share the same fate as him, that we are destined to fail. Thy deeds shall be met with failure, just as I. Failure, the shadow of his birth that has never left him. It comes to take him now, 
in his final defeat. The only person with any pity for Morgoth, the only one to mourn him, is his father. The Veiled Monarch was an illusion, so no one knows when he passes away. The body of Morgoth, Leandel's king, now human and beyond shame, is left at the foot of the Erd Tree. No one notices, no one in the capital even stumbles upon their thankless king. Morgoth knew he could not have an Erd Tree burial, but he is not even offered the dignity of a standard one. Instead, he is found by Godfrey, who cradles his son with tenderness. Sirosh roars, while Godfrey maintains his composure. Morgoth then fades away, and whatever is left becomes the guidance of grace. The Greater Will uses Morgoth once more, as motivation for Godfrey in battle, a means to an end. Morgoth succeeded as a tool for others, and as a shield for the Erd Tree. But it was always Marika's aims, the Greater Will's plans, our ambitions, that succeeded in the end. Morgoth may never have been given a true victory, but there was never a more true servant of the Erd Tree, or one who loved it more. Morgoth's actions were not saintly. He uses his soldiers as tools, he deceives his own people, and until death he sanctions omen killers. Why would he do this when he has lived a life as an omen, when he knows it's torture? He does not abolish this cult because he believes omens will harm the Order of the Erd Tree, and he will not let compassion, ambition, loathing, or anything hinder his service. Does Morgoth inspire love? Does he deserve respect? If the omens were free, would they forgive him? Were his actions worthwhile, or did they amount to nothing but a delay? We can be certain that Morgoth held absolutely to his principles. He did not decide to spite the world for the way it treated him. He kept faith and did his duty to the end. He hid himself from those who would not accept him. He forgave those who abandoned him. And he loved and protected what always rejected him. Does the Erd Tree grant him one blessing in the end? A true death and escape from suffering? If this is a kindness, like everything the Greater Will has ever granted Morgoth, it is a cheap one. To live a life like Morgoth's would make it so easy to turn to despair and spite. To end up thinking, what does it matter then, if the curse claims it all? But Morgoth rises above his circumstance. The Omen Helm asks, The heart of an omen without the body to match, could there be any crueler existence? There is one. It's opposite. The heart of a lord with the body of an omen. And Morgoth lived this existence with honour. If you enjoy our lore content, and want more Elden Ring videos, be sure to like and subscribe, it really helps us out a lot. And if you want to support us even more, you can find a link to our Patreon below.